My name is Cindy Kelly of Tomic Heritage Foundation and this is Friday, November 7, 2014 and I'm here in Hope Sound, Florida and I have with me Gail Kenny. And the first question to, is to please tell me your name and spell it. My first name is Gail, G-A-L-E. My middle initial is G as in George, G-E-O-R-G-E. -E. My last name is Kenny, K-E-N-N-E-Y. Terrific, thank you. Now, um, I was going to just ask you a little bit to tell us a little bit about your um, background. Uh, first, with you know, what's your birthday, and then where were you born, and something about your your childhood and education. Um, I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, back in December 16th, 1923. Um, I lived in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania most of my life. Uh, and uh, uh, my father died when he was How old was he? When he was 40 years old. And um, so uh, I went on through junior high school and high school. And when I graduated from high school, I was able to get a, a um, scholarship uh, to the University of Pittsburgh. And I went there and studied mechanical engineering. And uh, uh, I had uh, about three and a half years in the university curricula and so forth when it was uh, uh, when I was drafted into the service. Uh, while I was at college, I had joined the uh, OCS, the Officers Candidate School, uh, school at the university. And we learned a lot about the Army. And we were taught on, uh, uh, by a officer from the service and uh, uh, we marched, we had uniforms, and uh, it was a nice organization. And uh, the, the uh, government wanted us to sign up <clears throat> for the service. You didn't have to, but uh, some fellows did and still stayed in school. And I elected to uh, stay in school and I did not si sign up at that time. Um, so when it came time to, uh, as, as things went along with the service, and, and uh, uh, I uh, was drafted out of school, and I had three and a half years in of education in the mechanical engineering department at the University of Pittsburgh, and uh, and then I went into the service. I still had to finish my school later, which I ultimately did. And uh, I was uh, sent on to Fort McClellan, Alabama in the infantry, and I did my basic training there. Uh, while I was there, I was given some tests and, and asked if I, uh, what I would want to do in the Army. And uh, uh, I took these tests, not knowing the ultimate results, what would happen to me. When I finished my basic training at Fort McCullen, Alabama, 
I was preparing to go home on a furlough, and then we were going to go overseas. Um, but however, I got a call from the orderly room in the army in the army that they wanted me to come down and see them b before I left. I went down there and they told me that orders had come through for me uh, to either go to Officers Candidate School or go to um, OCS. OCS. Um, Office of, it, no, because that is Officer Candidate yeah, School. Officer must be Candidate something. School or go back to college and study engineering. I elected to go to uh, back to college, which they sent me down to Texas A and M College to study more engineering. I, I I did not go overseas at that time, and when I finished up. Down at OC, uh, down at Tennessee. Um, let me go back. While I was in the service, I was given a lot of tests. And one evening, I had to get down and take tests for a couple hours, uh, whether to determine whether I wanted to go to OCS or back to college. And. Um, I decided that uh, uh, after they sent me down to Texas A&M College and I finished up, uh, I didn't know where they were gonna send me. And uh, it just so happened that orders came through for from, from me in a couple days and they sent me up to Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Um, I didn't know no, what I did not know at that time what was going on at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, but I was uh, assigned the barracks, and and then later on, a couple of days, uh, they told me that I was going to stay at Oak Ridge, and uh, uh, and that's where I was for the rest of the war. Um, when did you arrive? What, what, what year was this when you got there? When I arrived at uh, Oak Ridge was back in 1944 or 45, probably 44. And, uh, and then I was given an assignment at, uh, in a place called K-25. And I went out there and was given some duties in the, in the building. Can you, um, did you have, I'm gonna back up for a second. Did you arrive at Knoxville? I mean, did you did, do you remember anything about how you got to first arrive at Oak Ridge and what your feelings were as you were going into this unknown place that was, I mean, how much did you know about what was going on in Oak Ridge? I don't remember how I got there, other than the government paid my way. And, and, and I went to the barracks. I was assigned uh, to the barracks. And then there were subsequent meetings, I guess. I can't recall, but subsequent meetings uh, and uh, and eventually uh, I was taken out to K-25 and, uh, and and told what was going on but not the, the consequences of what was going on. Just, they were operating a plant and they had just built this plant. We just finished but hadn't been operated. And one of my duties that they assigned me to do is test the equipment before it was put into service. Uh, in order to test the equipment, uh, they assigned probably seven to 10 young ladies to me to 
test all the piping and fittings for leaks. If it was a weld went bad or the fitting were loose or anything that would cause a leak. So we had to go around and pr with probes and at all welds and so forth to test to see that they were all tight and everything was working. There was no leaks in the system. And you had to go from one building to another building. There were several buildings in K-25. And uh, so you had an assignment to go to certain buildings and test the equipment after it had been installed. I had nothing to do with the in installation, but after it was installed, that's where I came into play. I had to test the equipment, and then we had us after the tested it and found it was all right, we had to condition the equipment before we were, any uranium was fed into the system. So after it was conditioned, then we had the responsibility of charging the, the uh, material into the, the system. Did that happen all at once? No, no, it took several days, probably a few weeks to do all that because K-25 was a big place. No, I was thinking, did you charge each? I know it has separate uh, you know, buildings and within the building it had a separate stages. And so I'm just curious whether you would finish your inspection in one building and then charge it, or would you wait till all of the buildings were You'd done? You'd wait until all the buildings were done, if I recall correctly, and then you charge the material all at once, too. You couldn't just charge a little portion of the, of the operation. You had to charge the whole building, as I remember. So how many teams were there of uh, leak detectors, like your, your own? I have no idea. They didn't tell us. I had a team of people, and we went in there several nights and days to test all this stuff. But uh, I had no idea. They didn't tell you anything. You had to do what you had to do, and that was it. So your team um, did worked several shifts? At oh, yes. They worked shift work. I did a lot of shift work. Once. Once all the material was in there and the, and the equipment was conditioned, suitable to charge with the raw material, then we were on stream and uh, uh, we were assigned uh, a shift. And I worked night shift, day shift, and midday shift. I'm just curious whether the seven or eight that reported to you, you all have the same shift then? No, so they, no, no, no. They just mixed it no, up. Yeah. No. You didn't need that many people to operate a, a shift in the building I was in. But um, uh, they just, you had more people testing, I guess, than you do working as operators. So do you remember whether you worked in you now the third floor there was a operating control room mm -hmm. and then below the two floors below was were the actual um cascades or the equipment mm -hmm. so did, did you sort of go between the two yeah, sometimes yeah go between the two i mean the controls were upstairs there and then you had to go down and check the pumps to see the pumps were working and so forth this was a gaseous diffusion plant, and uh, you had to work, see all the, that all parts were operating properly, yes. And I was working at, once it got on everything on stream and everything was going smoothly, it was no problem. But occasionally you ran into a problem where you had to shut down a portion of it and, and correct the problem, and then start get it running again. Uh, one of the areas that I worked in was in the tail end. You had a heads and tail end, or tail end where you took the waste material off the, off the system. And uh, when you were working that end, uh, they would bring in a, a so-called <clears throat> um, two-ton empty uh, cylinder. And like, uh, 
and uh, you'd have to hook that cylinder up to the system and fill it with waste material. And uh, I worked uh, in, in the tail end most of the time. In fact, I don't think I ever worked where they took the final material off. And we did this 24 hours a day. Was that sort of the unenriched uranium then, that, or just only slightly enriched uranium, or that the waste material? Was it recycled? The, no, it, no, no, what, no. As far as I know, it was done. Once you took the material out of, out of the charge that was in the system and put it in the container, they took the, the 2,000 pound container full of waste material out and put it in the field. So the container was sealed. Oh yeah, well, there was a valve on the end, that's all. They closed the valve and then they came and put it on a dolly and took it out in the field. Now when they got it out in the field, I don't know what they did with it, whether they, how they made sure the valve wasn't open or couldn't be opened, but they stored them out in the field. They called them chlorine cylinders, but they were empty. Um, what was it like to be inside the plant when it was running? What was it? Was it hot? Um, was it? No, it wasn't. It was comfortable to, to run. The, the, the plant was very big where you'd have to use a bicycle to go from one end to the other. I mean, there were several people who had bicycles. Some of the supervisors that were controlling the operation make sure everything was running properly, had bicycles. To how, do you remember how long the plant was? I had no idea. Yeah. Is that right? I, I didn't measure it or anything like yeah. that, but it yeah. was long. I mean, if you want to walk from one end to the other, uh, you wouldn't do that in five minutes. Probably 20, 30 minutes. I, I, I never did that. I never went that far. I was confined to an area that I was responsible for operating and that was it. Do you remember um, the kinds of buildings and facilities that surrounded the K-25 plant where you might have uh, gone to, to change clothes or uh, were there uh, cafeterias nearby, uh, <clears throat> things like that? There was a cafeteria nearby, but I don't know how close it was. There was a cafeteria where we could go and have lunch, yes. And uh, we went there. If you, it depends on shift, working shifts, and they, they covered it with a nice cafeteria. So they did have it available. But um, the government uh, gave us a uh, $1.80 a day to live on. And uh, uh, we used that at the cafeteria, of course. And uh, later on, they raised it to, I guess it was after the, after the war ended, they raised it to $2.40 a day. So that's, that's how they took care of us food-wise. We didn't have a, a, uh, our own, the, the own uh, facility to eat in. We just went there and and used our card or whatever we had at that time for our lunch or breakfast or whatever. Of course, I was a GI and I was getting $54 a month pay plus the dollar eighty cents a day allowance. And uh, later on, they they increased it to the to the um, to the uh, $2.40 a day food allowance. Uh, and when you were off duty, you could use that card downtown where you went, went uh, for your meals too. There were cafeterias all around the place. And, uh, but, uh, and we took a bus. We, had to take a bus from where we lived out to where the 
gate 25 was located and we get the bus back when our time was up. So what was it like riding on the bus? <clears throat> it was all right, no, no problem riding the bus. Were people really tired at the, you know, on the end of the shift? I really didn't notice it. Yeah. I mean, you worked your eight hours and that was it. You went back to, to your, wherever you were living. Uh, when I first went there, uh, it was in barracks. And then after I started working, they assigned me to a, uh, uh, a hut with three other fellows in there. And so the four of us lived in this hut for a while. I don't know how long it was, several months. And then they took us out of there and gave us a, um, put us in a, an apartment building and had a room in an apartment building, which was very nice, much nicer. You had your own room and the facilities there were much better than uh, we had over at the, um, other place. There's one big room, yes, yeah. and four people, mm -hmm. four people to a hut. And bunk beds? And no, there weren't bunk beds. Everybody, not in that facility. Uh -huh. and how in, is in, 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 a, uh, in, in the other, the, uh, the big, big building, um, they may have had bunk beds, I don't remember that. But your room in the apartment, what was that like? Nice, real nice, very nice. But we had to take a shower at the end. Ed. You still had a, didn't have a common shower. You had toilet facilities, as I recall, but, but uh, you had to go down the hall to take a shower. They had a big shower room there. And uh, had, I guess they had elevators going up. I we didn't walk upstairs. They had elevators, I guess, in this building. It was a nice building. And then you'd eat your meals in a, in a um, cafeteria? Cafeteria, all the time. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Was it near a shopping center? The one or? downtown was. Of course, the one out near the plant was not. But it was located, so I think people from other companies could use too, not just people working in K-25. Do you remember the name Happy Valley? Happy Valley, I remember that, but I don't yet place it. it. It was actually used during the construction of K-25, and it was right across, well, what is now the Route 58, but it's, a, you know, the, the turn, the highway, mm -hmm. basically, but Probably there wasn't a highway there, but it was, um, you know, full of, of um, temporary housing and uh, trailers, and yet they provided for recreation. They had something called Coney Island there, and it. Should have... I think that was for people that were pipe fitters and they weren't in the service. Uh -huh. uh, they had a, families down there and so forth. So they weren't really close the K-25, but this Happy Valley is where a lot of people live in trailers, yes. There was an area there where people lived, uh, the construction people, pipe fitters and so forth. Right, right. Yeah. And I know they tore it all down, and I can't remember when, whether that happened before the end of the war or whatever. I really, yeah. I, I know it existed. I wasn't near it. Uh, I had no business being over there. I stuck with my my job, and that was it. Yeah. Um, so tell us about, um, there were a few things you did that didn't relate to your job, such as meeting your, your um, wife. Can you tell us that story? Uh, no, my wife wasn't, I wasn't married. You didn't? No. You didn't, did, how about the dances on the tennis court? Oh yes, they had, they had, um, Tennis court dances over the week on the weekend, Saturday nights mainly. If I recall correctly, nice music. Someone came in and played records and so forth, and uh, everybody enjoyed that. It was a nice affair. 
you didn't miss that unless something special was going on or unless you were working <laughs> because the plant ran 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But the tennis course dances were very nice. And uh, I also, uh, this air, certain areas at K-25 had basketball teams. And I joined the basketball team in in area I worked for. And uh, I think we played at the high school. It was a high school there, I believe. And we played at basketball tournaments a lot. And I enjoyed that. And uh, also, um, uh, there was enough men there from colleges that had played football in college to have a football team. And they did have a football team that played teams that came in into the area, and it was good. We'd go down here and watch, watch a football game when, when you could, you know. So uh, Oak Ridge had their own football team. That was another plus. Of course, I didn't play football, or, and they had uniforms and everything else. But occasionally, I would go into um, Knoxville and watch the University of Tennessee play football during football season. So it was an activity that you could go and enjoy, you know. But another thing that happened to me out was, was I fell into a nice arrangement. A friend of mine was transferred from Oak Ridge down to um, um, the one down in Texas, no, Los Alamos. Los Alamos. Mm -hmm. And he had a car, he had a 1933 Chevrolet, and he couldn't take that down with him. So it was running and everything. So he said to me, are you going to buy a car? I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm selling my car, I got to get down to another place. So I says, how much do you want for it? He says, $30. So I says, okay. So I bought it from him for $30. I drove it around and I said, well, the lights aren't too bright. So one day I, when I was off work, I drove into Knoxville to a automobile store and I bought new headlights for it and a new battery. And had no more trouble with the car. Frank came back and I had a car to go someplace other than Oak Ridge. And it used to go up to a place called Big Ridge, up in the mountains someplace. And they had a lake up there and you'd go up there on the weekends on a Saturday or Sunday and swim and you could do a lot of things up there. So it was nice. So when it came time when I was discharged and was leaving the place, uh, I had a buddy, a friend of mine, Bob Higgins, uh, I said, you want a car? He says, what do you mean? I said, I I'm going home now. I says, yeah, you can have the car. He says, oh, I'll buy it from you. I says, no. I said, you take the car, use it. If you sell it, get, I'll take a dollar or two. So he used it for a while. He stayed down there. Of course, he married a girl down there, too. And he, uh, he stayed down there with the car, and uh, eventually he sold it and sent me a check, for, he sold it for $50 and sent me a check for 25. <laughs> it was a great time. That's terrific, you almost got your entire money out of it. Well, it, it didn't bother me at that time. I wasn't concerned about, yeah. about money. Do you have any to compare it to what a new car would cost in those days? What would be a new car cost? Oh, I imagine a new car back in those days would be $500 or more, but yeah. this was an old 33 Chevy, and it ran, and never never stopped on us, and so long as you took care of it, so. Oh, one time we did decide to paint it, though. Paint was going bad on it, so we bought us some paint, Buddy and I, and we painted it. It looked good. What color did you paint it? Black. <laughs> Fun. Do you have any other um, <clears throat> memories of, of uh, good times in Oak Ridge? Um, well, I enjoyed playing basketball. I enjoyed all the people I met down there. I met a lot of nice people. Um, 
Bob Higgins, um, was one of them. He's from New England, and uh, uh, John Flynn. Adam Mondell, well, by the name of Sunblad. A lot of good, good people, and they were nice and had good times together. That's my impression. <laughs> yeah. But we worked hard, too. Don't get me wrong. So, I mean, uh, like Bob Higgins worked in the instrument department. He repaired instruments of the control instruments of the facility. You had a when you operate a plant like that, you have to have some time people maintaining the instrumentation. And uh, my job wasn't in that area. My job was operating the plant, making sure the pumps were running, the pressures were right, and uh, uh, that uh, everything was in good shape. But uh, sometimes a pump would go out on you or you get a leak in the system or something. You got to fix it. You got to shut it down. Stop. Start it up again. So I worked in op what you call operations. And uh, and when at the end of the plant, I had to take the bad stuff off, put it in the cylinder, button the cylinder up with close the valves and all that, and have it taken away. So. That was a process. I did process work, and there were people who did maintenance, all kind of maintenance. It was well-staffed with good people. And you knew that the process was a gaseous diffusion process and the product was enriched uranium. You, did you know that much? <laughs> I did by the time I was done, yes. Yeah. But at the beginning, I didn't know. No one told me. You have to find these things out for yourself, more or less. And, and that's what I did. It was, you, and then you could go from one area to the other. You had a badge, and you were only in one door and out one door. You couldn't go across the street and get in. You, they had pretty well, uh, pretty well guarded. It, uh, that people couldn't get in and out. Of course, I never tried. I had a door to go in, and when I left, I left the same door. But uh, it was well, well protected, the facility. They had, uh, uh, the Army had their own uh, people there, uh, the uh, guards, their own guards, police. Do you remember uh, something called a security portal, a portal where they had uh, the guards as you entered, you had to go through a little turnstile and show your badge and before you entered kind of the premises of the K-25 plant? No, yeah. never heard that. Yeah. Um, let's see. Were you aware of any um, spies or any I was never aware of any, it... any spies or nobody asked me any questions at all what was going on out there. I've never been confronted by anybody. So other than the military police, you weren't aware that there were counterintelligence people? No, I was not aware of anybody other than the, the military police that were there. Did you find... Um that people were, were, would stop themselves from sharing information, say, oh, I'm not supposed to talk about that? Were there, was it a constant uh, presence or, or thought in your mind, or I have to keep, make sure I don't disclose things? No. No, I didn't consider that at all. But I did enough research that I could pick things up myself go to the library or something, look, at, look something up, you know. I can't recall really what 
I did, other than use, use a library for reference for things, and that might have been one of them, but I didn't get everything out of the library. You pick these things up uh, as you go along, and by the time I left, or, well, by the time things, everybody knew what was going on, and I had the same opinion. So when, when did you find out what it was that Oak Ridge's purpose was? Several months after I was there. I mean, I knew it was a chemical process and, and so forth, but I didn't know what the material was. No one told me. And no, a lot of people didn't know either. I wasn't the only one. But eventually, you'd put two and two together and so forth, and you'd say, well, this is going to be a bomb, some kind of a bomb, what? I didn't know what kind of a bomb it was going to be, but they were purifying this uranium for something. And you know, I finally found out it was uranium that they were purifying and stuff like that. But we had these 2,000-pound empty cylinders that we charged, or put the waste material in, but it was, I know the material wasn't, wasn't uh, chlorine, but we were put, putting them in chlorine cylinders. They were previously used for chlorine, but they were empty. So do you think that the um, uh, women enjoyed their jobs? Oh, yes. A lot of women enjoyed their jobs down there. They did. And I guess you were, you had work experience before, so was this new to have all these women working alongside the men? Uh, yes, where I worked before, uh, we didn't have a lot of women working, no. But they did their job, and they, they were very conscientious and, and so forth. I had no criticism of the women, you know. And uh, one of my buddies had a girlfriend, which he eventually married. She was very nice, but she wasn't working at the facility. And uh, but she told me she she, she told me she was going to give me a Yankee dime. And I said, a Yankee dime? What's a Yankee dime? She comes over and gives me a kiss. <laughs> I I didn't know what a Yankee was, dime was until she told me. <laughs> Or gave me one. <laughs> That's great. I hadn't heard that one either. That's great. Oh. I never forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That's great. <laughs> so, let's see. I'm trying to think of... Uh, so, can you remember the day that um, they announced uh, the bombing of Hiroshima? Oh yes, everybody was happy and that the war was going to be over and so forth. Yes, everybody was down there was happy and uh, I remember it. Everybody kind of celebrated, you know. It was very nice. Everybody was pleased. Were people surprised that Oak Ridge had such a big role in this? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. And I know after it was all over and so forth that, I mean, people, I guess, were amazed, but were they surprised? They expected something to be happening. But at least I expected something, but I didn't, I didn't know what it was going to be. And then after, it was all over, several, a couple of months later, they were going to uh, have a ship go out in the Pacific Ocean and set off a bomb out over there. And I was asked if I wanted to go out on that ship. And I chose not to go because I wanted to get back and go to school. I wanted to get out of the service and finish my education. I still had a semester to go, 
the, my degree at the University of Pittsburgh. So my goal was to get that degree and then I could do those things. So I elected and choose to take my discharge and, and go back to uh, Pittsburgh and get my degree. Now, the company that was operating the plant down there wanted me to stay and stay on and work down there. And if I didn't work there, they wanted me to go to a plant they had up in Cleveland. But I, I wasn't about to go to Cleveland yet. I wanted to get that degree. And uh, they said, well, stay down here and go to University of Tennessee and get your degree. But still, I wanted to get back to my own school that I started out on. So I did get my discharge and went back to the University of Pittsburgh and uh, received my degree in, in, in one, one semester. And then what did you do? And then I went to work for a company called Copper's Company, K-O-P-P-E-R-S. And they had a big operation in the city of Pittsburgh. They had a 31-story building, Copper's Building. And uh, they were um, in the business of building and designing um, uh, Coke ovens. Coke ovens where they made Coke. Uh, it was a dirty pro process, but uh, they, uh, they, they had this Coke ovens that they charged with coal. And of course, Pennsylvania had a lot of coal. And, and uh, they, what they would do is, is they charge these ovens and make a product called Coke, which was almost 100% carbon. And they would sell the Coke to the steel mills, which a lot of them in Pittsburgh and all over the country now, uh, where they used the Coke in smelting their, uh, in, in, the, in, in, the, in the Coke, in the steel mills to make steel. So I went to work for that company. I started out on a drawing board. <laughs> and eventually I moved into operations. And uh, I ended up working for them in various positions. I was able to get uh, uh, a, a uh, I got a, a And think of it offhand. But anyway, I worked for coppers in various positions throughout the, the company in, in designing and operating uh, tar plants. We, the byproducts that we got from the Coke plant, they took them and processed them into other products that they use. Uh, Coke oven tar, we, we had uh, uh, creosote oil and stuff like that. And um, <clears throat> So um, I have a patent on one of the operations that I did and when they had problems and I, I solved the problem and got a patent on it. And uh, so I worked for Copper's Company for uh, about 38 years. And I was in safety and, and uh, I set up uh, uh, safety programs and and uh, medical programs for some of our plants. And uh, uh, so it was a very interesting job that I had. And uh, after 38 years, though, it was time to hang my head up. So I retired after 38 years. And then four years later, I moved to Florida. And then while in Florida, I did some safety and engineering consulting work. I was an associate of a fellow by the name of Gary Robinson, and he had a uh, business down here that uh, was very interesting. Uh, and uh, we did a lot of work for law firms uh, in uh, uh, legal, the illegal end of it. And uh, so I worked in that job for 15 years. 
And then I decided that was enough. But it was very interesting work. So how was your experience, if you can, uh, well, how, how did your experience in the Manhattan Project kind of shape the rest of your life or your thinking? Oh, well, you work hard and you get compensated for it. And I worked hard down in Oak Ridge like everyone else did. And uh, I enjoyed that kind of work. Uh, was process, and, and I ultimately did a lot of process work and uh, uh, operational work in plants for, for Copper's company. Yes, I enjoyed that. And um, I learned a lot. And that was it. I earned a living. <laughs> So you've never looked back and said, oh, if only I had gone to OCS, maybe. No, I never looked back. I always looked ahead. You can't correct the back too much. It's, it's what you see ahead of you is going to be meaningful for you. I enjoyed being at Oak Ridge. I enjoyed all the people I met down there. And uh, It was a wonderful experience, believe me. And uh, I went back to Oak Ridge, though. They had a reunion. I forget how, it had to be about 10, 15 years ago. I, I'll bet it was 15 years ago. And I was invited and I went back. Drove over to Knoxville and ended, stayed in a hotel, in, which they didn't have at the time, in, uh, in Oak Ridge. Uh, Oak Ridge, and was, I met a lot of old friends. It was nice. I enjoyed it, yes. I haven't been back since, but that was one time. And it was nice to go back. And then what they did when I went back, uh, they had buses taking you out to, to K-25 or wherever you worked. You didn't go in the building because the buildings were shut down. So we went out there and ride, riding around the buildings and so forth. It brought back a lot of memories, all good memories, yes. Of course, the place has changed a lot, too. They improved a lot. They had probably more schools down there now. I, the, the town had grown, yes. But I enjoyed a return, and there was a big difference from when I was there, yes.